Good morning. Welcome to Ask the Theologian on this Tuesday edition with Dr. Randy White. But I am not Dr. Randy White. I am Pastor Mark Bass, filling in as the guest fo- guest host for him as he is out of pocket today. Nonetheless, we are going to be taking your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. And I am excited to be with you. It is a great honor and privilege to be able to do this. And uh, with that being said, let's not waste any more time. But I want you to know, even though we are not in studio in beautiful Taos, New Mexico, nonetheless, we have our companion Bible, we have your questions, we have our tie And this is Ask the Theologian. Thank you so much. Now, with that being said, let's go ahead and look at your questions today. Our first question comes from YouTube, looking to see if I have a name on it. I'm not sure. There's a D above that. I don't know if this is from Deb or not. But I'm going to work on answering your questions nonetheless today. So, the question is, what is the simple answer to the following statement? What does it matter if Paul was writing to Jewish believers? There is no Greek or Jew in the body of Christ. All are under grace. Thank you. Okay, so this is a good question. What does it matter if Paul was writing to Jewish believers? This is a debate (laughs) and maybe a source of even conflict amongst right dividers because there is this idea with some that if if Paul wrote it, we just need to take it and, and do blanket application for us. The, uh, the issue is there are certainly parts of Paul's letters that we need to understand are written to Jewish believers. I think there's a number of good examples with this. I think if we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let me get Biblify pulled up very quickly for you. And as a matter of fact, I believe that uh, Dr. Randy White talked about this on his show yesterday. But if we do not make this distinction that there are key times in Paul's epistles when he does, in fact, write to Jews, then we can definitely come away with some messed up theology. And as I get this pulled up here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, let me find the verse here. So let, let's, look at, let's look at verse verse 10 here. And so... Paul is writing here and says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the good things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, there are some right dividers who take the position that this is for us. And they, they build that doctrine because Paul is our apostle, and since Paul is our apostle, everything that Paul writes must be referring to us. The issue is, is you are going to find things in Paul's epistles, Paul's writings, that are simply not going to fit well with our dispensation of grace. And and this is because Paul still has a heart for the Jewish people. He has a ministry for them. Let me get our YouTube and Worshify pulled up. I do not have all of the exciting technology that Randy has, so I have to somewhat deal with, uh, with what I've got here. And it's great to see you all this morning. Glad to have you here with us. Thank you so much on YouTube. Let me go over to Worshify really quickly and uh, get logged on there as well so I can be following along. And that way I know for sure if I am coming through loud and clear, you can hear me well. And so with that being said, let's let's go back and, and, and review this matter. There's a number of times in Paul's epistles that he makes reference to the Jewish people and, and even the kingdom program. And if we do not make that distinction, you've got 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 that you're going to have to deal with. So now where we originally thought, okay, there is now complete reconciliation between God and man for those who have come to the Lord by grace through faith and the completed work of Christ, then we have a verse like 2 Corinthians 5.10 that just throws a wrench into the system. And now it seems, well, There's some kind of reward system, and maybe not even just a reward system, but a punishment system, because it says in in verse 10, he may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. Not just if good, this is not just a rewards statement here. This is also a a judgment statement, whether it be good or bad. That's that's one example I would point to. I think that if you go to uh, some verses, for example, we could go to Ephesians chapter 1. I think that this is where, obviously, a lot of Calvinists make mistakes. 
if we don't make some distinct uh, discernment here, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful brethren. This is where a lot of modern translations make a mistake because they do not stay faithful to the underlying text. They do not follow the Greek. And the Greek clearly states there are two separate groups. There are the saints which are at Ephesus and then there are the faithful in Christ Jesus. And it's my position, it's Dr. Randy's position, that if you take the saints and you follow that through, you are going to see that lines up with Jewish believers. And you'll see that in the book of Ephesians as you travel along the way. And, and so whenever we come across these, uh, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, and so uh, I, I want to point out that right there. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. We have it straight, uh, straight out of Scripture that the Jews are the ones to whom belong the adoption. Let me pull that up for you really quickly. Um, I believe it's Romans chapter 9. As we uh, go down, yep, Romans chapter 9 verse 4. Uh, I, I could finish up a little bit. Let's, let's look at verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren. I wonder who's Paul, who Paul's brethren are. My kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul's making it very obvious for us who he's talking about. Looking at verse 4 now. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption? That's very interesting. Once again, if we go back to Ephesians, he has predestined us. We are adopted. Who is we? And if you look at the pronouns following through, you clearly see we is Israel, and, and then ye would be the, the, the non-Jews, uh, those who of the body of Christ that are not Jews, uh, by, by the flesh. They have not been circumcised. They were not proselytes. They've purely come by the grace offer, not the kingdom program. And so, thank you, Edith from Missouri. I have the look down. You cannot appear on Ask the Theologian without the tie. And so, uh, with that being said, we have my mom on here from Ratan, Oklahoma, I see. And, uh, and so, with that being said, I think that it, it, it certainly does matter. Whenever we go back to that original question that you asked, that question being, uh, in, in uh, let me see, let me get it pulled up here for you. That question of, what does it matter if Paul was writing to Jewish believers? The, the reason it matters is because there are key times that Paul is referencing the Jewish kingdom message. I think that you can see that again in Ephesians chapter 4. If we, if we go there, let me give, a, give you one more verse after I wrap up here, but let's go to Biblify. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And let's read right here. Let me find the verse. Give me just a moment. I know it's Ephesians chapter 4. I just got to find it for you. I was very confident that it was in chapter 4 of Ephesians. I may be looking in the wrong passage here. I don't think that it... Okay, yeah, it's chapter 5. So um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Here's another one for you. Verse 5, For uh, this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And, and I think that this is a very important matter, because if, if Paul is talking about our salvation, it seems like there's some works that are incorporated here. You cannot just come by faith. You cannot do these things. You cannot be a whoremonger, an unclean person, covetous man, an idolater. And so all of a sudden, it, that, that verse in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5, really runs counter to what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace ye are saved through faith. 
This is not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then Paul goes on and says in Ephesians chapter 5, 5, you cannot do all these different things. Well, Paul, now all of a sudden you're incorporating work. Not doing something is a, is a work. And so with that being said, I want us to look. What does it say in Ephesians 5, 5? Hath an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Not talking about our salvation today, not talking about ours by grace through faith. Paul is making an, a case here that these Ephesians, both these, these Jewish believers and these non-Jewish believers, they, they don't need to be doing these things. Be ye therefore followers of God as, as dear children. Walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. But don't engage in fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Don't, don't let these things... And then he says here, let it not be once named among you as become as saints. These are not things that the saints are to engage in. And these are things that we as the body of Christ shouldn't be engaging in. Now these, these things are not determining our salvation. Our salvation is sealed in faith in the completed work of Christ. But that doesn't mean that we should just use our freedom as Paul writes about in other epistles as an opportunity for, uh, for sin. So with that being said, to close on your question, yes, it absolutely does matter because it helps us get good, sound theology. And that's what we want. We want good, consistent, sound theology so that we can defend the faith. And so, uh, absolutely, that while there is no Jew or Greek in the body of Christ, all are under grace, there certainly are key times in which Paul makes references to the kingdom gospel to the Jewish people. And if we can discern those, we'll be sure to not mix in law and grace, kingdom and grace, and make those mistakes. Thank you so much for that question. That brings us to our second question. Question, I have a friend that continues to believe that prayers work. <laughs> and, and that's your question there. Hmm. You have a friend that continues to believe that prayers work. Let me think about this. So... Prayers are in our dispensation, I would say. I think that we can see Paul giving thanks to God. We can see Paul, uh, whenever he talks about the, uh, sorry, the armor of God, he, I think, I think he is, is including prayer as, as a part of that. If we go to Ephesians chapter 6, we just may be in Ephesians entirely today. Ephesians chapter 6, as we go down here, as he lists the armor. In verse 8, you know, after he lists the helmet of salvation, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now, that's a very particular time. The, the, the Jewish people, there was still this overlap with the kingdom and this grace. Israel had not been cut off yet. The, the temple hadn't been destroyed yet, so there is some reference there to the Spirit, or to the saints, but, but you do have that first half of the verse, praying with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And, and so I think that prayer is not something that we need to completely devalue. I think that there's some value in it for us to offer praise to the Lord, and, and certainly God, in this age, we do live in the age of the silence of God. He is not operating in the world like he did in the times of, of Scripture being recorded, and he's not operating in the world like he will one day. But there is, the, the, there, is the, uh, the, there is this reality that we have to acknowledge, that there is a silence of God. God is not under any obligations to answer prayers. He is an, under no uh, requirements to fulfill anything that we ask of him. And so I, I understand the heart of your question. You have a friend that believes that prayers still work. Let me, let me answer it this way. It can't hurt. <laughs> um, there's, there's nothing wrong with offering a prayer up to the Lord. Understanding that God's under no such obligations to answer our prayers. But we can certainly still pray for one another. Um, you have been praying for, for my wife and the babies, and I thank you so much for that. And, and certainly that is something we can do. It, it, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is righteous, we can dwell, dwell on these things, offering prayers to the Lord. But we have to understand, and I think this is where your question's coming from, you are right. Um, in, in the sense of prayers, are, they are not guaranteed to work. Just because we ask something in the name of Jesus, you know, there's that verse, if anyone asks in my name, it will be done. That's not a promise to us. We're not guaranteed that our prayers will be answered. 
And so for your friend, what I want your friend to understand most importantly, the big danger is if your friend is operating under the position that prayers do work and prayers are essentially God's promise that he will fulfill what we ask of him, they are setting themselves up for some, some crises. When they, ought, they ask a prayer and it's not fulfilled, they will certainly have their confidence shaken. They will, they will deal with a lot of, of heartache and trouble if they are operating under the premise that, that prayers are guaranteed to work. And so I would say to them, we are not promised anything on this earth. We are not guaranteed health. We are not guaranteed wealth. We are not guaranteed prosperity. And no amount of prayers will guarantee us any of that. I think that we all have amazing stories in our lives, things that have happened that we can't explain, whether it's miraculous healings, cancer, fill in the blank. We all have amazing stories, and, and I'm not about to sit here and say that God cannot do what he pleases when he wants to. But what I am telling you and what the heart of your question is, yeah, Scripture's clear. We live in an age of the silence of God. I will, I will share this with you. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. And I think this uh, sums up our, our age, our dispensation very well. As we, uh, we go here, and uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as Paul finishes up the chapter here, let's read, let's read right here. Starting in verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. The end of prophecies will come. The end of tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But, that, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. We, um, as we get down here, when I, when, as I, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. I would say to your friend, you know, our prayers are not guaranteed to work. God is under no obligation. And honestly, he's done everything for us that we need. He has given us reconciliation, the opportunity of salvation by grace through faith in the completed work of his son. And prayers are an opportunity for us to praise the Lord. It's, it's an opportunity for us to, to have a fellowship with the Lord in that way. And, and we can offer our prayers up to Him. We can make our, our requests known. But we need to understand that He is not necessarily going to answer all those prayers. But what we do have, what we are guaranteed and promised, are faith, hope, and charity. These are what we have. We have faith in Christ. We have a hope of, a, of an eternal life. We have a hope of a resurrection. And we have charity love, agape. And the greatest of these is charity. And, and I had a good friend put it this way, a charity, and he's exactly right. Love will be the one that remains because whenever we see our Savior face to face in eternity, in glory, well, there's no more faith because we don't have to, we have, we don't have, to have faith in something that is happening right in front of us. And the hope it will, will eventually go away because we don't have to hope anymore. It's all right in front of us. And, but what will remain is our love, our love with God. And, and this is all made possible by what he is offering us today. That is a tough, tough conversation to have with a friend, especially one that has been raised that if you just pray hard enough. But I think there's been so many people really devastated because they prayed so faithfully for something over and over and over again. And it, it, it never came into... It, it, it never came to fruition, and it really devastated them. And it was because they were operating under that premise that that their prayers were guaranteed to work. And that's just not the age we live in. We live in the age of the silence of God, but He has done an, an amazing work in Christ. So that is certainly a certainly a, uh, a tough one. Um, prayer for the body of Christ. Either says Philippians six seven. Yeah, certainly. I'm, I'm not saying for us not to pray. <laughs> Don't get me that. Don't get that wrong. Um, uh, yeah, we, we do need to pray, but we just need to understand uh, the, the, the position application for it in, in our day and age. But by all means, we, uh, we appreciate all the prayers that you give for us, for my ministry, for my, my wife and children. Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, we praise God that we can pray and that he will hear our prayers uh, for, for nothing else other than the, 
the opportunity that it gives us to, uh, to talk with our Lord. All right, let's move on to our next question here. Am I not moving at such a, a, such a better pace than, than Randy? He, uh, he, he's, he would be chasing so many rabbit trails at this point. And I just had to, to get that in there just to give him a hard time because that's my job. The, uh, the, men, the, the job of the mentee is to uh, give the mentor a hard time. And so uh, let's go on to our next question here, our uh, question number three on the day. Let's see. Let me find it again. Third question, number three today. Uh, this is from Edith. What are your thoughts on the following description of right division? Oh, I'm excited about this question. How would you tweak it? Okay, number one. Before rightly dividing God's word, set aside all previous interpretations. I'm going to take this as it goes. So how would I tweak it? So I'm looking for something about it that I would like to change when it comes to the definition of right division. Before rightly dividing God's word, set aside all previous interpretations. Edith, I think that that is a great first step. I, I think that one of the reasons why so many people have issues with understanding right division, that they have issues with accepting right division, is because they are bringing in all the garbage. <laughs> They're bringing in all the bias, all the things that they were told from preachers beforehand, from commentaries beforehand, even hymns that they sang. I talked about that today on Shields and Arrows, the, the bad doctrine that is in a lot of worship songs today. Yeah, you need to set aside all those previous interpretations. Uh, I think that that is a, an excellent approach. Set it all aside. Don't bring in any bad habits, anything like that. As we go on here, number two, determine who is speaking to whom in all circumstances. Uh, Edith, I think this is right as well. Um, you want to know who is speaking. You want to know who they're speaking to. And you want to know what the circumstances are. And, and I think that's correct, absolutely. You need, to, you need to interpret Scripture in context. That's one of the big flaws of Calvinism is they have no concept of, of context. I want to share something with you really quickly, <laughs> and then I'll, and then I'll uh, get back to answering the question. I made this uh, a little while back, oh, a year or so ago, and this is my theological education bell curve. Randy has his charts, and here you go. Uh, I'll give you mine. And... The, the uneducated, small, rural churchgoer, fundamental, conservative, they are going to read the Bible for what it says. And whenever you read the Bible for what it says, you're going to get context. You are going to pay attention to who's writing, who they're writing to, and you will be able to understand the circumstances because you're taking just a plain approach to Scripture. And so when you do that you are going to come away with a very simple understanding. Israel was under the law. We are under grace. However, there is this point within education, the establishment seminary, the pastors of the big churches. And what they do is they, in their self-believing to be experts on everything, they throw out context, they throw out the plain reading. They start reading way more into Scripture than what it actually says. So what they end up doing is they make a fatal mistake and they ignore what you just laid out. Those very important, very essential fundamentals of understanding who is writing, who they're writing to. Now they'll claim that they'll teach that in hermeneutics, but they don't. And so these establishment seminaries and pastors will make the false doctrine that the elect, because they don't pay attention to context, have always been under grace. That will be a big mistake they'll make. They will say the elect have always been under grace. And that is simply incorrect because they're not practicing good theology. Now, if you look on the very far end of the bell curve, these are the actual Bible scholars. These are the theologians. These are your right dividers. They pay attention to context. They read Scripture for what it says. Now, these will probably do a much better job of overall defending the position as opposed to these. <laughs> but what, look at the conclusion they come to. They come to the same conclusion. They come to the conclusion that Israel was under the law and we are under grace. And so, uh, Edith, I say all that to say, I think you're absolutely right. These, the professors and seminaries would do well to pay attention to the context. Now, uh, as you go on here reading this, 
Study literally using basic reading skills to determine content without application. Okay, this is excellent too, Edith. I don't know if I'm going to be able to disagree with you. I'm trying to find something I disagree with, but I, I like it. This is a great outline. And, and the key thing I like that you included there was determine content without application. This is, goes completely against Rick Warren, Space Pets, look for application in every verse, the big mistake. I talked about this also on Shields and Arrows last week. We have to stop making the habit of looking for application. Because whenever you look for application in every single passage of Scripture and try to make every single passage of Scripture about you, you, you end up performing eisegesis, you read yourself into the text, and you're going to make bad theology because not every passage is about you. Even as we talked about in our first question, Paul's letters. Not everything in Paul's letters is meant for us. Some of it is still to the nation of Israel. We have to rightly divide the word of truth. I know some right dividers may get tired and think, well, I've, I've done enough right division. No, you need to carry it out a little bit further, and then you'll have very solid, airtight, biblical theology. And so, yeah, study literally. Take Scripture what it says. I get so tired of hearing preachers say, well, what Jesus really meant was, or what that passage actually means. I know it says this, but what it really means is this. Whenever Jesus told the rich young ruler, uh, if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments, what he really meant was, that is a giant red flag, and that is so frustrating, because what you're saying is, is we, we just need to make Jesus a a mysterious code talker. That's all Jesus was. Jesus only talked in codes the whole time. He, he never was straightforward. He never explained it like it was. He was always talking in these cryptic messages. And that's just not the case. Jesus told us exactly what he meant. And, and if we would just take the Bible literally, things would make sense. The reason why we're all so confused, the reason why preachers are so messed up on their theology is because they've rejected a literal meaning of the text. They've rejected a literal meaning in the Old Testament, which is why they claim that everybody's always been saved by grace for all time, which is not true. And they reject the words of Jesus talking about the kingdom, not talking about our salvation. Jesus talking to the Jewish people, Romans 15, 8. Jesus was a minister to the circumcision, fulfilling the promises proclaimed to the fathers. And so they just end up making terrible, terrible hermeneutic mistakes. They need to follow Edith's advice, and they need to take Scripture literally to determine the content, and they don't need to look for application in every passage. They don't need to look for application in every passage. I agree. Perfect. Uh, next one. Compare Scripture with only Scripture. Following the above steps. Okay. So compare Scripture with only Scripture. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, one of the big mistakes is is we, is we read a passage that we don't fully understand, and what do we do? We go to a commentary, we look up a sermon, we, we make a lot, of, a lot of critical mistakes because we don't let Scripture interpret Scripture. Scripture is Scripture because it's the Word of God. It has the ultimate same divine author, and Scripture affirms itself. And so we need to go to the Word of God and let it define itself. I don't, I don't care what R.C. Sproul said, I don't care what Spurgeon said, I don't care what Piper said, I don't care what any of, I don't care what Augustine, I don't care what any of these said. Because they are not writing the Word of God. I care about what Scripture says. Now, there may be a, an author, a pastor, somebody say something good. I've read some good books from authors that, that, have, that have some good things to say, but it's not Scripture. I don't use it for my Bible study. What you need is a, you need a King James Bible and you need a strong concordance. That's what you do. Do the work. Study it for yourself. Thank you. Um, that, that's really good. Uh, you, you finished up with saying following the above steps inevitably, inevitably leads to the obvious fact that God's word is written primarily to Jews and only a very small percentage is to and or about non-Jews. Edith, that is, that is right on the money. And that is something hard for a lot of Christians to accept, you know. And we even use the term Christian, which was the term used to describe Jews who believed that Christ was their Messiah. That's a tough pill to swallow. And that's why a lot of people have a hard time with right division, because what it does is it has some serious ramifications. It means that I cannot just look in every book and find the Word of God speaking directly to me. And some people don't like that. But what matters? What matters is the truth. And, and the truth is we live in a very special time in which God is dealing with us as individuals, not dealing with the nation of Israel. 
And you're right, so much of the Bible, the vast majority of the Bible, is concerning the nation of Israel. But how blessed are we that we live in this window. <laughs> uh, we live in this little passage of time, the mystery, the dispensation that was hidden previous ages, but has now been made known. That was revealed unto the Apostle Paul, where we can be reconciled to God as individuals. Edith, I, I can't see any flaws in your description of right division here. And, and so maybe I would just say something like, if, if I was just to nitpick it, maybe you could add a fifth step. You kind of left, you know, number four, but, but we're, we're describing right division. What you described was very good Bible study, and if we want to describe right division, if we want to get technical on it, we do need to find right division, and I would say right division, to add a little bit more to that, would be understanding the differences between the dispensations and distinguishing between the gospel of the kingdom and the mystery age of the dispensation of the grace of God and, and discerning between what was written to the Jews and what was written to the body of Christ. I, I would include that because what your steps were was an excellent step-by-step -step guide for good Bible study. But if you are wanting to describe right division, which, let me say this, right division is just good Bible study. <laughs> Um, right division is good Bible study. If you do good Bible study, you will become a right divider. Now, with that being said, though, to, to define right division, I think I would go ahead and include we are discerning the differences between the, the ministry of Peter versus the ministry of Paul, Peter's ministry to the Jews, the little flock, and Paul's ministry to all nations, the body of Christ. Edith, you, uh, you did great, though. I really, I really appreciate that and how you worded it. Uh, excellent job. Let's look at our second set of questions here that I have today. Let me see if I can track these down for you. I do not, like I said, have all the fancy technology that Pastor Randy has. Let me look and see. Do we have some comments here? They are just rolling in today. Let's see here. Great to have a, yeah, I, it's fun it's teasing uh, Dr. White about everything. And uh, I, I did see a question asking if Dave McPiper was going to make an appearance. I'm sorry, Dave. You know, I think maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Dr. Randy White's dodging Dave today. He had to come up with an excuse why he couldn't be in office because he knew Dave's question was just going to be too tough. And <laughs> so, with that being said, no, he uh, he had a he had a pre predetermined appointment that he could not do the Dave McPiper step at. Uh, segment today. I am trying to talk him into doing Dave McPiper tomorrow. Comment. Do you want? Do you want to see Dave McPiper tomorrow? Because Dave has a great question, and it is certainly going to get uh, Dr. Randy White all sorts of fired up. Uh, talking about earlier, Deb on prayer. Prayer brings us comfort. I agree. I, I think that a morning that I wake up and I and I say a prayer, it, it makes me feel much better um, about my day. There's just something about focusing on the Lord and not being self-absorbed all day that's good for you. It's not good for us to be self-centered. It's not good for us to be self-centered. And so uh, with, with that being said, Myra, Green Bay, I'm getting all the bragging rights on beating the Cowboys. And so uh, with that being said, uh, thank you once again, Edith. I enjoyed that question. Let's jump into uh, some more questions today. Let's see if I can help get... Randy caught up on all this because he always gets so behind. This is from Daniel Lowenberg. Uh, Daniel, I don't know where you're from. I know, I know Randy knows where so many of you are from. I apologize, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Um, why did Cain kill Abel? The biblical text is somewhat mysterious on this issue. Okay, so why did Cain kill Abel? Let me go to... Biblify and get this pulled up here. Uh, Genesis chapter 4. Okay. So let's just go ahead and look at verse 1. Genesis 4, 1, and, Abel, and Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Very interesting there. Uh, Eve, you know, that phrase, man from the Lord, that would be Eve. You would think she's saying, this is the promise. This is the child to crush the serpent on the head, the seed of woman. Verse 2, and she again bare his son Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel 
He also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect uh, unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And so let, let's pause there really quickly. Um, I just want to make a note. I think sometimes preachers read a whole lot more into this matter of Cain and Abel than what we really know. And some will say, well, it needed to be a blood offering, and that's why Abel's was accepted. But in the, in the law, the Mosaic law, there was grain offerings to the Lord. You had fine flour, grain mixed with fine flour, oil, things like that. So I'm not convinced that Cain, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. It's what he did. He didn't have sheep. He had, he had crops. So I don't think that, that Cain bringing a crop to the Lord was the issue. Uh, I think that there was probably something about maybe Cain's mentality that Cain, Cain had, had some issues, that he was presenting this sacrifice in an unworthy manner, um, in his heart possibly. But, but to say that there, there should have been a blood sacrifice and or Cain was a child of wrath or whatever the case may be. So, so many times preachers love to talk about stuff that they really don't know near as much as what they claim they do. But, but all we know is that Abel's sacrifice was accepted, Cain's was not. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And it shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now, that escalated quickly. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we go from having... Some disagreement there. Uh, uh, well, disagreement in the sense of uh, a, a Cain apparently thought that maybe his offering was worthwhile, and God said, no, Cain, your, your offering is not approved. It does not receive my approval. Therefore, uh, Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell, and Abel was approved of. So, so you already have, you know, with brothers, tensions are high. Cain, not happy that he was outdone by little brother, I'm sure. But... For him to, to slay him, for Cain to do that, to, to have his brother out in the field. You know, it says that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. That term, that term rose up there. I'm curious if we have many other times that we see rose up a number of times here in Scripture. Let's see, Deuteronomy. Just see where it appears in verse 13. And there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer and given thee a sign and wonder. So it's not necessarily always a, a combative, just he rose up. He rose up against Abel and slew him. So, once again, I think that I'm going to have to make an unsatisfying answer and say that we don't know the whole story, exactly why Cain's motivation was the way it was, why he decided to rise up against his brother, but anger, just pure, unbridled anger, unbridled rage. I, I was trying to look up against there, rose up against Abel. Could they have gotten in a fight? Could it have been as simple as as that there was just simply a, a fight between the two, a fight broke out, it carried on longer than either one of them intended, it went farther than any of them intended. You know, sometimes, you know, if you ask people, well, how did Cain kill Abel? They would say, well, he killed him with a rock. But do we have in Scripture that Cain killed Abel with a rock? Or is it just that, that Cain rose up against Abel and slew him? You know, sometimes it, it says that the rock was the first murder weapon. You see it depicted that Cain is going to kill Abel with a rock. Um, but they, you do a search for Cain and rock in the Bible and you don't see that so he, he rose up and slew him maybe he used a, a tool maybe he used an agricultural tool maybe he used a rock whatever the case may be he, he rose up and slew him so, so this could have been because this could have been a fight go too far maybe Cain said he was going to kill his brother and, and at the end of the day I think that this, this brings up an interesting point though that Cain made that decision. And maybe I'm not going to satisfy you very much on this answer. To, to read into the motives, why he did it, I don't know if we can answer it for sure. I think that, that Cain was furious. 
He was angry. Was this pre premeditated? Um, and Cain talked with his bro with Abel, his brother. Okay, let me let me read verse eight again. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Was this premeditated? I think that most people would say this is premeditated. I think most most pastors. I'm curious what the Jewish scholars have to say on that. Was this premeditated? Did Cain lure Abel out? We always have those preconceived notions about what the story actually is. We've had people explain it to us. Oh yeah, Cain led him, you know, led him out there, premeditated and murdered him. Maybe that's the case. Maybe the scripture demands that. What do we know though? And that's kind of what my big my big point is. What I want to focus on is what do we know? We know that Cain talked with his brother and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel and slew him. So there was clearly some anger within Cain. There was some fury. Possibly it was premeditated murder. That kind of seems to be the generic take on it. I'm not one to just take the generic interpretation. I just I want to see what Scripture says, and I'll make up my mind for myself. But, but what's interesting, though, is I want you to consider this fact right here, that Cain had a choice. God said, Cain, you can do good, you can do evil. And for those who hold to such a harsh view... <laughs> Or, or really the view entirely of total depravity and original sin, that whenever Adam sinned, he completely changed and his nature was so corrupt that he could do nothing but sin. And he was, he was completely depraved after the fall. I think that Cain in Adam's position was the same. Adam was given the option, Adam, you can be obedient, eat from whatever tree you want except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then with Cain... The Lord said to Cain, Cain, sin lieth at the door. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There's that opportunity, Cain. You can either conquer sin, you can do good, or you can be disobedient. And so with that being said, why did Cain do it? Because Cain uh, allowed anger to get the best of him. That's how I'm going to read it. Was it manslaughter? I don't know. I don't think the text really probably goes that direction. I think it's much more in the context of a murder. But he did it because he was angry. He did it because he had this, uh, this anger towards, uh, towards the Lord, or towards his brother in that. And, and anger towards the Lord as well, I would say, as he was wroth with the Lord. So uh, thank you for that question. Those are really good questions. It, it makes you wonder. It makes you want to uh, ask the question. Maybe one of these days we'll get, get such an answer. Moving on to our uh, next question here. We got Rudy. And Rudy, you are, are you from Belgium, Rudy? Is that right? No, someone else is from Belgium. Is it Edith from Belgium? There's so many people from so many places. You'll have to forgive me. After a little while, after I've done this show a few more times, I'll get it all down. Um, so Rudy asked me a question. Why do Calvinists preach the gospel if God has already decided who will be saved? Rudy, this is a good question, and what you are doing is you are, you are just showing how absolutely silly Calvinist theology and doctrine is. Um, so much about Calvinist theology is, Rudy, I just saw your comment on Worshipify. Give me, give me just a minute, um, and, and I actually explained how I came to write Division, Rudy, um, on my interview with... Uh, with, with Randy uh, last week, I think. But I, I'll, I'll try to do that at the very end um, before I uh, run out of time. But, but th this shows a big problem with Calvinism. Calvinism holds so many views that are the opposite of each other. Let me find a passage of Scripture for you really quickly to reference. Let me uh, go down to... Trying to find what passage I'm looking for. Let me do this. Okay. Romans 10. Romans 10, 14 is what I'm looking for. Okay. Paul writing here, here's what Paul says, uh, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So, so this would be a passage that I'm assuming Calvinists would use to build their doctrine that, yeah, we need to go preach. This is what we're told to do. Of course, they're going to use the Great Commission because they don't pay attention to context. They are going to read the Great Commission and then say, you know, go into the world, make disciples of all nations. And so, so the Calvinists, they make everything about them. So clearly it's in Scripture we need to go proclaim the gospel. We need to go preach. We need to share the good news. And so, so they have their doctrine uh, of this responsibility. And yet at the same time, they hold this doctrine that, well, God's already preordained who he's going to elect. And, and this opens up such a can of worms on Calvinism, such a can of worms, because the problem with Calvinism is it is not logical. It, 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 is, it, it has fallacy after fallacy after fallacy, and, and it doesn't make sense. The great thing about right division is it makes sense. The Bible makes sense, doctrine makes sense, theology makes sense, but Calvinism makes zero sense because it, it, it only works on the surface. Calvinism only works on the surface. Okay, so here, here's the doctrine. God elects, he preordains who he's going to save. Okay, so there's that. God chooses some to be saved. He chooses some to go to hell. However, in order for them to be saved, they have to hear the gospel preached. Okay. In order to be saved, they have to hear the gospel preached. So that means that we've got to go out and preach the gospel in order for them to hear it because they're elect. So they've got to hear the gospel because they're elect in order to be saved. So which one is it? Is, 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 is it hearing the gospel or is it they are elect? So th then this creates, well, I guess everything that happens has to be preordained. This is obviously the ultimate Calvinist view that every single thing is preordained by God. Every single event, what you had for breakfast that morning, because who knows, you know, what, what you were doing along the way to, to plant the seeds for eventually that person to finally receive salvation according to God's election. And so everything has to happen a certain way in order to fulfill the preordaining of God's election. You know what that means? <laughs> you, know, you know what that really means? It means that God's racist. Because if you look at the percentage of Christianity, it is, it, it's not even. If you, if, if you, I mean, look at how, how many people there are that are Hindu. Look at how many people there are that are Muslim. Look at how many people that hold to Buddhism. Look at how many people are, are unreached and, and hold pagan views. And so what this, what this results in, the consequences of that, is it means that according to God's divine election, because we have to go preach, if you have an unreached people group that are dying and they haven't heard the gospel, at least maybe their generation, maybe somebody before them heard it, but then they forgot about it. God did not elect that unreached people group because nobody's came and preached to them. Because if somebody from that people group was elect, then somebody would come and preach to them and then they would hear the gospel and be saved. And so, so God must be very racist and not want people that are not white Christians to be saved. <laughs> That's what Calvinists do. They, they, create, they create a terrible God. They create a God that wants to send people to hell. They create a God that, that hates certain groups. Clearly, God must hate the Hindus. He must hate the Muslims because they're not hearing the gospel being preached, but we are. We're the special ones. We're the, we're the, we're the precious, uh, elect, chosen people of God. So, so what, a, what a silly, what, what a silly position they hold. And, and so it's so inconsistent. Are, is, it, is it hearing the gospel and believing the gospel, or is it God electing you? Of course, and then the Calvinists love their little stories about how Jesus appeared to Muslims in a dream. I don't buy those. Or, or whatever the case may be. Why is it that Jesus only wants to show up to Muslims? Why is it that we don't find some tribe somewhere that says that Jesus appeared to them in a dream. Why is it only Muslims that have vaguely heard the name Jesus mentioned before? Why is it Muslims that have heard Jesus and that Christians believe Jesus is the Son of God? So, so the, the fact of the matter is, this doctrine of Calvinism does not pass a basic 
philosophical, logical, rational test. It doesn't. It makes no sense. And they hold the fallacy after fallacy, and, and it is an indefensible doctrine. So, yeah, uh, Rudy, great question. Yeah, they, they can't. It, it, their, their doctrine makes no sense. It's a, and and I, I certainly hope I see a day when Calvinism is completely defeated because it's, it's indefensible. And the fact that they, they think that they can defend it shows how terrible a Bible students they are. And so, so why they preach the gospel? Because they, they have a double think. They hold double think. They believe two things to be true at once because they, they have an illogical doctrine that's not based upon Scripture, Rudy. Okay. Here we go. We got another question from uh, YouTube here. I have a friend who keeps insisting that Isaiah 26.9 applies to all mankind, and isn't this a promise to Israel? One of the great things about being a right divider is the Bible is simplified for you. And I can tell you, yes, this is going to be referencing Israel because it's in Isaiah 26.9. <laughs> so uh, there's your answer. But let's go ahead and look at it and see what it says. Maybe, uh, maybe there's something going on. Let's see here. Isaiah 26.9. Let me see. Let me go up just a little bit further. Let me read a few more verses. Um, okay. Ye, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Ye, with my spirit within me, will I seek thee early. For when, and this is the part I think you're referring to, for when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Okay, so, so your question is, and this is, a, this is a good question. There are times whenever you're reading the Old Testament, you're reading your Bible, and you will read something that sounds like, um, that, that sounds kind of like our gospel, that kind of sounds like our, the body of Christ in, in a sense. Because all nations, you know, certainly the body of Christ were made up of all nations. Except for what the Calvinists believe. The Calvinists believe it's only for uh, the, the special people, not those other nations. <laughs> but with that being said, this passage, Isaiah 26, 9, this, this is uh, something that we need to understand. The, the body of Christ, our mystery, grace, gospel, this dispensation that we live in, certainly is a blessing to all other nations. And I apologize if you're hearing some sound in the background. I'm in the conference room because that's where my internet is best at. But while this grace gospel is a blessing to all nations, I want you to understand the kingdom gospel, too, would also be a blessing to all nations. The, the, the kingdom being established, the messianic kingdom, whenever the Messiah comes, the, the, the son of David, Jesus Christ, reigns on the throne, this will be a blessing to all nations as well. Let me, let me, look, let me look at that for you one more time. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Okay, so for when my judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Now, I think that maybe they can... I think, I think your friend maybe needs to read the rest of that passage. If we look at the rest of this, let favor be showed uh, to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of, up, of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they shall see and be ashamed for their envy, uh, envy at the people. Ye, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. And so, uh, and, and Lord, thou will ordain peace for us. I think that if we read that context, the whole context there of Isaiah 26, verse 9, that, that judgment on the earth and the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness, that's not entirely just a, oh yeah, and, and when Christ comes, he will have judgment and he will also teach everyone righteousness. He will teach everybody goodness. I think righteousness has a lot to do with judgment. And that righteousness, they will learn righteousness. The wicked on the earth, whenever they are... Whenever they think that they are high and mighty, carrying out whatever desires they have, the Lord's going to come and he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And he is going to bring judgment and he is going to bring righteousness. And those nations that said, hey, this is what we do, this is what we stand for, they're going to learn what righteousness is whenever the righteous wrath of God comes upon the earth. And so this is a, this is a, this is a fulfillment of the millennial kingdom. 
This is a fulfillment of that promise. Whenever Christ returns and sets up the kingdom on earth, he reigns on the throne. He reigns as the messianic king. And so Isaiah chapter 9, I would just encourage, tell your friends, hey, you know, take, take a look at, at the context of that chapter. Read the rest of it. Furthermore, we could go to Isaiah chapter 9, famous, you know, you read this at Christmas time. Whenever we, uh, we read this, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born. Who is us? Us is, would not be me and you, it would be the nation of Israel. Unto us a, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his, government, upon his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is, this is all tied to that. Isaiah is talking about that coming day of the Messianic kingdom when Christ will reign. And so Isaiah 26.9, your, your friend who may be confused, who seems to think that 26.9 is about us, they are, they're, they're not reading the context of it. I think they're reading into it what they want to get out of it. And also, a very simple answer is they are, they're, they're forgetting that this is a mystery age that we live in. Ephesians chapter uh, 3, Colossians chapter 1, Romans chapter 16. We live in an age that wasn't prophesied. The entire point or the definition of this being a, a mystery was it was not known in previous ages. So I think your friend just needs to, needs to understand the difference between prophecy and mystery and realize that the coming of the kingdom, yes, righteousness will be carried out, justice, judgment will be carried out, but it's in the context of that Jewish millennial reign. It's not the context of our salvation today. And so they need to read the rest of the passages. Don't use your, uh, don't, don't just pull out a random verse in the Old Testament to build your theology. That is not how you do it. That is a mistake that many people make. We got to read the context. Context matters. Now I'm going to look at a few more questions here. We got Deb from the Ozarks. This may be my last one, depending on how much time we have. For evangelical garbage. <laughs> oh, I don't want to take an evangelical garbage segment away. Should I go ahead and do an evangelical garbage? I don't have it. I, I think that you would prefer Pastor Randy to do it. Maybe one of these days whenever I get the, uh, the permission to do the evangelical garbage segment. How about this? JJ, Jay Peeler, you ask a question here from YouTube. How would you define an evangelical? What makes a church an evangelical church? I'm going to answer this question. This will be my last one. I'll take a few responses from you. Talk about right division just a little bit. An evangelical, you, you know, you have your two big categories, evangelicals, Protestants. Protestant churches, Lutheran churches, Presbyterians, and, and, and Anglicans, so on, they are, are gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna look like Catholic churches in a lot of ways. They're going to have their sacraments that they'll do in a lot of ways. They will, they, they will have the feel of a Catholic church. They will have creeds. They will have all these different things and, and look much more Catholic in, in their presentation. Evangelicals, their churches are not going to look near as Catholic. They're not going to take, partake in near as many of the rituals, the sacraments the, that the, the Catholics and Protestants do. Evangelicals are going to be more conservative for the most part. Protestant churches are not always very conservative. They'll be a little bit more liberal. Presbyterians are a prime example. Evangelicals are not going to do infant baptism. Protestants will likely do infant baptism. Many of them will. Evangelical churches are going to, they're going to say they're big on grace through faith. Some of them will be okay. Some of them may not be okay. Some of them may be too confused and mix kingdom things with grace things. Evangelical churches are not going to be fundamental churches. E um, evangelical churches are not going to care about what Bible translation they use, almost uh, certainly. They're not going to be very big at all when it comes to dispensations. They're not going to have an understanding of right division. They're not going to have an understanding of... The, the underlying Greek text that the King James is based off of compared to the modern translations, they're going to be very ignorant about these things. They will very likely not sing a lot of traditional hymns. A lot of modern evangelical churches have abandoned that. Now they're singing modern worship songs that don't have any doctrine at all. Um, evangelical churches, they'll, they'll... I don't know if Southern Baptists really call themselves evangelicals. I don't think that many of them claim the title. I know normally they say they're, they're not but there's not going to be much difference between them and evangelicals, just by a different name. 
Evangelical churches will include some of the different denominations, but a lot of evangelical, evangelical churches anymore are just going to be non-denominational. And they're not going to be Bible churches. They're not going to be Bible-focused. They're not going to be Bible-based. It's going to be very much milk toast sermons, run-of-the-mill type things. And so uh, I, ho I, hope that, I hope that helps. Fundamental churches are going to care. Most fundamental churches are going to be using a King James. Most fundamental churches are going to have some dispensational understanding. They're going to, uh, you know, a lot of them will be Acts 2 dispensational. Evangelical churches, preachers are going to look like preachers, or, sorry, fundamental churches, preachers are going to look like preachers, where e uh, evangelical churches, the preacher may be dressed like a college frat boy. And so, with that being said, there's kind of your overview. You'll, you'll know very quickly. If you walk into a church that is evangelical, it'll be apparent to you by the way that the pastor dresses, the Bibles that they use, the songs that they sing, and... A fundamental church will make itself very apparent. The way the pastor dresses, the Bible they use, and the hymns they sing. Uh, now, let's see here. I'm almost out of time. That hour went by fast. This is the first time I've ever done an hour-long broadcast. Let me look at some of your comments here as we get ready to wrap up the show. Yeah, Josh talking about Calvinism. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. Many people are confused. So I'm going to some of your, your comments here on YouTube. Thank you all for joining us. This is great to have you. I can go over time, Nancy says. I have 10 minutes of rabbit chasing time allowed. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's uh okay, let's 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 talk about let let let's talk about my right division program. Uh or my my right division conversion. So I was raised with very conservative parents and, and parents that that get my mom's on here. They gave me some dispensational understanding because they were raised on a King James Bible. <laughs> um that we didn't really use the word dispensation, but I was raised that Israel had requirements to keep the law. And that in our age and time, God is not dealing with Israel, but we can come to the Lord by grace through faith. And I didn't have a deep knowledge of right division. You know, I would read a lot of the Gospels, and I would try to make application there. I had no context of, of Paul receiving the mystery. Um, I remember Paul writing about a mystery, but I didn't really dig into it. So, so I didn't have much context and understanding of that. Whenever I got into college, though, everybody's a Calvinist because that's the cool thing to do. All the cool kids are Calvinists. And so I got confused and messed up a little bit. I never was a full-on Calvinist by any means, but I would hold to a few things, you know, total depravity to a degree except for we could place faith. So I, I held to original sin doctrine that we definitely had a sin nature. We were morally depraved, all those things. I, I, I really came to a point where the kingdom, I, I took a spiritual view of the kingdom. The kingdom is here and now, and Christ reigns in our hearts. One day Christ will return, but the kingdom of heaven, it's, it's within us. It's this age of grace. And so I, I really got so messed up by, by colleges supposedly thinking they were teaching the Bible and, and they were just teaching incorrect doctrine. I, um, I, I finally realized that I was not going to take the Calvinist route. I still didn't know quite what I was. And whenever I got married, I was still not nailed down. I was much, I was much more conservative than, than what I was before um, my days in college when it comes to scripture and, and, and matters. Uh, I never was a liberal, but now I'm very much saying that, yeah, the government needs to, needs to fix marriage, that we need to say that marriage is between a man and a woman. And we need to make laws about it. Used to, I was, you know, kind of lukewarm on that matter. Now I'm much more staunch, staunch conservative when it comes to marriage and, and all those things. But whenever I, whenever I met Pastor Randy, whenever we visited Taos, we just went to the Baptist church because that's what you do. And he, he met me. I explained to him that I was aspiring to be a pastor, that I wanted to, wanted to do this. And he said he would mentor me. He would help me along the way. And I had no idea what I was getting into. And he worked on me for a long time, helping me understand. And one of the amazing things was, is he got me, in a lot of ways, he got me back to what I was raised with. My parents taught me with, with understanding the difference between Israel and the law and the grace that we have today. And, and so with that, he, he just kept working on me over the years. And he, he trained me for two years before I was 
ready to take over a pastor's position. And I pastored for nearly three years at Liberty. I've been pastoring, pastoring here for six months at Blue. And I, have, uh, I can say I'm thankful to be a right divider for you know, four years now. So I have, uh, I have really been blessed. I've enjoyed it. I, I'm excited. I had no idea that my life was going to take this, take this turn, and it has been amazing. It's been so great to meet all of you, to have this opportunity. I never would have thought that that, that preacher that I met in, in uh, Taos, New Mexico would have made such a big impact and that I would be hosting Ask the Theologian as a 28-year-old man. And uh, so once again, I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, thank you uh, all for, for supporting us and, and, and standing for the truth of Scripture. I, I want you to be encouraged. I know that I I'm really kind of go against the grain when it comes to right division. Most right dividers, they're not young. You know, there's me, there's Trent, there's Nathan, and our wives, and it seems like that's about it. But I want you to know, I think the tide is turning. I think that we are going to gain ground because we actually have Bible answers. We stand on Scripture. We defend the truth of the Word of God, and we're better Bible students than Calvinists. We're better, we're better Bible students than standard evangelicals. And we are, we are going to continue to stand for that. And we are going to make progress. The fight is on. The trumpet sound is ringing out. The call to arms is heard afar and near. The, what is it? The army of God is marching on to victory. The triumph of the Christ will soon appear. So with that being said, thank you for joining us at Ask the Theologian, thank you for uh, bringing us your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. And tomorrow, Wednesday, Dr. Randy White will be back in the house where he will be taking your biblical, theological, and worldview questions. Thank you for letting me be your guest host. Be sure to let him know how I did. And maybe if you want me back one of these days, I may have to do this for him some other time. With that being said, thank you all so very much. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Tune in tomorrow at 9.30 for Shields and Arrows. Thank you all very much.